History repeats itself because geography is slow to change. Thus Hadrian's attempt to build a wall can be viewed as just another episode in the north-south dynamic of the island. This was, in turn, part of a wider geographic program of frontier hardening and consolidation initiated by the emperor. Part one of understanding Hadrian's wall started with a discussion of the demolition of the Roman wall to create a road, still known as a military road, in the wake of what turned out to be the final attempt to restore the political influence of Rome over the island. In this case, it was the Romans, in the form of Bonnie Prince Charlie, invading from the north, this time with the aid of the peoples the wall was constructed to repel. The geography of northern England is dominated by two north-south communication corridors, separated by the Pennine Hills, traditionally the A1 and the A6, although some of this is now joined to the motorway system of southern England. The issue today, as it was in Hadrian's time, is east-west communication, which runs across this trend in the landscape. The wall was a development of an existing frontier marked by a road known as the Stainegate, which linked a series of forts. The actual route runs to the north of the road, taking advantage of the windsill escarpment and other features of the landscape. This new frontier is longer than the Stainegate and would have required additional forts, facilities and garrisons. It would also require some form of road to integrate the frontier replacing the Stainegate. In addition, this is a pet program of the Emperor and building roads is what emperors did. It is clear that the evidence for the Vallum being an unfinished road fits the evidence better than any other proposition. It's also entirely in keeping with this being an imperial project. However, the implications of this idea, particularly the notion of failure, is very significant. There are logical consequences for this line of argument, all of which impact significantly on our understanding of the engineering and design of this project. Firstly, it is evidence that there was an integrated and logical plan. Secondly, at some stage, there was sufficient surplus of unskilled manpower to dig a trench on this scale. And finally, those resources, along with others, were no longer available as the project progressed. Something had gone badly wrong. When trying to understand the objectives of such an engineering enterprise, it has to be assumed as a starting point for any analysis that Hadrian and his court, and in particular Governor Nepos, had a logical, viable plan for the project at the outset. The wall, as conceived by Hadrian, had a gate every mile and a series of forts. Integrating this system using a road, which itself linked to the national transport infrastructure, would seem to be a vital part of the plan. The frontier can only function with effective transport and communication for the army. During the construction, having a good road would certainly aid the process of moving some of the bulk material. The workforce and garrison would require ongoing supplies of fuel and food. Fodder, even bedding for animals, is another important group of bulky items that require a supply train. An important point is that the hard surface road is required for wheel transport. The grassy margins serve pedestrians and riders, perhaps with some additional gravel where the surface is deteriorated. In this respect, the land set aside for the vallum could still be used, albeit with a trench separating the two lanes. It was not until the end of the century that a metal road known as the Military Way was built between the wall and the vallum. The south of England has, by and large, a more favourable climate and better soils and topography for agriculture, in particular arable grain production. Traditionally, the local population provided the grain to feed the Roman army, and at one time also was responsible for ensuring it was delivered to where the army required it. Leaving aside the complexities of grain production, it is a bulk product which becomes available all at the same time. Grain has to be kept dry as well as secure from insects and rodents, not to mention those enemies for whom the capture or even destruction of a quantity of grain would be an important objective at any campaign against the Roman garrison. The stone-built or timber granaries were situated at the centre of the wall forts, probably one per cohort or similar unit. This store of grain ensures that the unit could survive a siege and could operate independently. While wheat is just one of the bulk products required by the army, it is the most important. A simple model will suffice to illustrate the scale of the logistic problem. If we estimate the garrison to be about 50,000, each of whom has an allowance of, say, 6 kilograms per week, that gives us a total of 300 tonnes per week, or 15,500 tonnes per year. 
The seasonal nature of both production and, realistically, transport requires a very large logistical capacity. Given that carts and wagons are unlikely to have a capacity over a tonne, realistically, the best way of moving grain is by boat. In the Mediterranean, the Romans moved grain in very large boats, with capacities measured in hundreds of tonnes. In the context of building Hadrian's Wall, a large proportion of the army are going to be spending at least six months away from their usual bases and will require feeding along with any non-military workforce. Just as noted earlier, with reference to accommodation, the construction phase requires much greater resources than the finished frontier. The importance of the navy in this operation is illustrated by the granary found at the fort at Benwell, which was built by the marines. Two altars from the Tyne at Newcastle, set up by the 6th Legion, remind us that the movement of this unit to the north of England from Germany requires considerable naval capacity. The whole project would seem to be dependent on the ability to move men and materials by sea, which is infinitely more efficient and consumes much less energy than moving things by road. So while it is largely invisible to archaeology, the significance of the navy to operations in and around the island should not be overlooked. Of all the logistics involved in the construction of the wall, it is the food and labour supply that is the most complex and problematic, since they are related and involve not just the cooperation of the native population, but also the more random factor of the weather. The construction process itself is relatively straightforward by Roman engineering standards, the principal complexity being the gateways which require the construction of an arch. The Mile Castle's forts and bridges represent the more time-consuming aspects of the project, and were thus commenced first. The significance of building mile castles first also lies in the establishment of local sources of materials such as stone, lime and aggregate, along with the necessary infrastructure. It is possible to model the requirements of the more complex structures, but the bulk of the work is in the curtain wall, which can be modelled fairly simply. We can simply look at the volume of materials required as a measure of the effort involved in sourcing, processing and transporting them. Mortar is a mix of lime and aggregate in proportion, which similarly is used in a ratio with the stone. However, lime is produced by burning limestone and requires an equal weight of dry firewood, so this model also accounts for the significant input. Also, the weight of water used to mix the mortar is similar in amount to the aggregate used, so is also worth building into our model. From this, we can estimate that each cubic metre of our model wall would take slightly over two and a half tonnes of material. The broad wall had a cross-section of about 12 square metres, which at 1,500 metres per mile, for 80 miles, gives us a total figure of about 3.85 million tonnes. The process of building even a simple model forces us to consider the complexities of such a project since it is apparent that these issues had been addressed in the initial plan for a stone frontier embodied in the broad wall, although the failure to complete this plan has long been central to the confusion that has surrounded the building of the wall. Using our model for the curtain wall, we can compare it to what is actually built, which shows that about 25% of the wall was completed to the standard. This is about what is required to finish the curtain wall in, say, four years, given that a year had probably been spent in the timber wall and setting up the project. The progress would be appropriate for a year of a five-year project. The requirement of significant amounts of dried firewood to burn the limestone may have imposed a time constraint on the project. It will be year two or one, two, three before there is sufficient lime available. It should be noted that coal can also be used instead of wood, which does not require seasoning, of course, and can be used at a slightly more efficient ratio of one part coal to two parts limestone. By applying the same basic modelling, we can look at the amounts of materials involved in the main linear phases of the frontier. This is in terms of both what was achieved and what would be required to finish the job. This model only reflects the amount of manpower that would be required to move these masses. In the case of the ditch, the spoil is thrown a fairly short distance, whereas the vallum it is moved at least 30 feet, with a great deal more care being taken with its disposal. This graph, however crude, does demonstrate a very important point about the project. Clearly, neither the broad wall nor the narrow wall 
was finished as planned, both falling significantly short of completion. The second significant difference in this model plan is the vallum. To complete this as a road would require almost as much material as the wall, adding significantly to the ambition and scale of the initial program. The digging of the entire trench and the disposal of the spoil implies a surplus of unskilled labour at the point when the vallum was built. Since the subsequent developments were concentrated on the completion of a stone frontier, we have to assume a large pool of unskilled labour with nothing better to do was available at this point. Another observation is that considerable amounts of the foundation had been laid ahead of the actual construction of the mortared stone wall in this early phase. Again, this tends to indicate a pool of unskilled labour not actually involved in the construction of the wall itself. Lime production may have taken some time to establish due to a shortage of dry fuel. All of this points to an early date for the construction of the vallum. After the early stages of the broad wall, all subsequent activity is characterised by a lack of manpower. All of this stresses the point made earlier. The failure to finish the construction of this road amplifies the effect of this first dislocation, as David Breeze has christened it. Thus, in simple terms, and in regard of the linear structures, instead of only completing a quarter of the initial plan, they only completed about an eighth. Even if we throw in the finished narrow wall, we are still only looking at about two-thirds of the wall ever being completed. So that the idea that the vallum was an administrative boundary and is a late addition is quite incompatible with a manpower situation apparent elsewhere. The essential problem is now, who dug the vallum and why did they not come back to finish it? There is a tradition that the vallum was built by auxiliaries, but this is based on the finding of a shattered centurial stone in the vicinity of the vallum. This type of inscription comes from the wall and usually from later periods, and is quite irrelevant in this context. The fundamental observation about this initial phase and the true purpose of the vallum helps contextualise the later phases of construction. The importance of the timber phase is that the so-called turf wall section demonstrates the form of the wall with its arrangement of mile castles and turrets was already fixed in this initial phase. The vallum respects the layout of the early timber phase and the broad wall, arguing for an integrated single plan. All of this suggests that the initial plan under Nepos was to replicate the timber wall in stone using a broad gauge with forts six to eight miles apart, although in the middle sector some of the existing forts would have been used. This is an important point. The model argues that there were no new forts planned in the central sector where the wall runs along the windsill escarpment. This implies that the planner, or rather most likely Hadrian himself, felt it unlikely the wall would be attacked in this most naturally defensive position. As noted, these earlier phases seem to have significant labour resources, with the foundation running significantly far ahead. Since priority would be given to the more complex structures not allowed for in our model, the initial progress in the first couple of years although appropriate to the scale of the task, is nonetheless impressive. Equally, what happens next is very shocking. In the first of what David Breeze has called dislocations, the construction project is temporarily abandoned, and when it restarts, the plan has changed considerably. While the vallum is respected and its integrity generally preserved, any attempt to build a road has been abandoned. Work now concentrates on building a scaled-down wall known as the narrow wall, 20% smaller than the original plan. At some point it was decided to add three forts in the central sector. Another change to the plan is the extension of the wall to wall's end, where another fort is added. However, both the addition of the forts and the eastward extension imply a second and major modification to the plan. While the first dislocation can be explained as a response to a significant reduction in manpower, this second event implies that the wall in the central sector had proved ineffective, and similarly it had been shown vulnerable to being outflanked to the east. After Hadrian's death in 138, his successor Antonius Pius abandons the project and decides to build a new and shorter wall further north in Scotland. It was not until the end of the century that the stone frontier of popular imagination, and perhaps as originally envisaged in some respects, 
was finally completed. Having separated the original plan from the subsequent modification, it is possible to model the original concept for the frontier. Most significant are the mile castles. They are regularly spaced regardless of the landscape, and this is not the work of a local commander in the field, but a top-down decision which it is reasonable to assume was an idea conceived of by the emperor. These gateways every mile represent a ready-made break or breach in the stone frontier blocked by a wooden door. To the Romans it is important to be able to move building materials and other items through the wall, and militarily they represent the same counter-attacking doctrine embodied by having forts with four entrances. These mini-forts are unlikely to accommodate more than 40 soldiers in normal use. There is no evidence for an officer or hierarchy which suggests they are less than a full century. There is an oven, but no granary. This group of men are responsible for the mile castle with its two gates, a mile of wall with two turrets. The initial forts are about seven miles apart, and allowing a cohort of a fort, that's 600 men, to look after nominally six mile castles, that gives you roughly a hundred men per mile. Assuming there are a hundred men in each century, of which 80 are frontline and 20 are in support roles, then half the troops are in the mile castles and half back at the fort. Cavalry, although important, are not really relevant in the manning levels of fixed fortifications. While all this works quite neatly, if we assume we have a garrison of about 40 men per mile castle, which we split into three watches of 12 men and a corporal, this gives us patrols of three men guarding each gate and three in each of our turrets. From this it should be clear that even if you put a hundred men in each mile castle, they would be fully occupied defending the fixed installations. In short, a hundred men cannot possibly defend a mile of curtain wall, that is one man per fifty foot. By comparison, a legionary fortress has close to one man per foot of wall. While patrols of troops marching up and down the wall and fighting off attackers is a beguiling image, it simply does not work as a realistic tactical or strategic plan. Beyond simple observation and communication, the only realistic way a small garrison in the mile castles or turrets could interdict an attack on the curtain wall is by using artillery. It is clear from a variety of sources that Roman artillery had the range capable of allowing it to create interlocking fire between these fixed installations. Anyone trying to cross the wall in the middle between the turrets, which seems a logical place, would be actually subjecting themselves to fire from both flanks. The turrets and the mile castles would have had wooden floors, doors and fittings, so would have been roofed, which again runs contrary to the usual representations of the wall. However, the model highlights the relationship between the wall and the turrets, which prompts the question, could the wall be accessed from a door in the turret, and more significantly, was there a walkway with a parapet? While it may seem counterintuitive, there is arguably insufficient men available to utilise a walkway so the wall may not have had one. The problem is just as acute where the wall joins the mile castle. It would be completely self-defeating to allow access to mile castles from the wall. Either the mile castles were significantly taller than the wall, or there was no walkway. Although mile castles only make sense if they are significantly taller than the wall, so both may be true. In this context, providing a walkway and access along the top of the wall would only provide an advantage to the attacker. While this CAD model was originally built to examine the roofing and rainwater drainage patterns of these structures, it does serve to highlight the issues inherent in our visual approach to the wall. Building models like this one that effectively don't work and we would consider to be wrong are actually a very important part of the process of structural analysis. The strategy of a gate every mile, supplemented by a fort with ten gates, three in pairs opening to the north of the wall, has to be regarded as a mistake. But it is symptomatic of what might be regarded of Hadrian's approach to the design. It is rigid and initially inflexible, stuck to religiously, despite the subsequent events. While whole forts were added, the basic design for the curtain wall was never modified. As we noted earlier, the frontier is dependent on the cooperation of the territory to north, so that the principal Roman forces to the south have time to manoeuvre to meet any threat. The wall would be vulnerable to surprise attack in force, rapidly overpowering one or more gateways. Once the wall is breached by a significant force, the rest of the garrison is now facing the wrong direction, 
and faces the prospect of being defeated in detail. Surprise in this context is being caught with your forces not properly disposed or distributed to engage in a battle. This is the usual cause of Roman defeats. The project portrays a great confidence that the political and military conditions will not change, and that the populations and the leaders on both sides of the frontier will continue to be supportive of the idea of walling themselves off from the rest of the island. After the collapse of the Broadwall plan, there is a move to physically block many of the gates, even in the forts, which, as we pointed out, is an obvious weakness. The adding of the forts in the centre indicates that this had proved to be a weakness. It is not unreasonable to presume that this area had been attacked. The extension of the wall five miles to the east, to Wall's End, also implies that a vulnerability had become apparent. The removal of the crossings that originally bridged the construction trench at the centre of the Vallum is also highly significant. It appears to be an improvised measure to strengthen the position. What it principally achieves is to make it more difficult to use any captured gateway for horses and baggage. It also demonstrates that command and control was in place when this decision was made. And secondly, a significant threat had prompted this action. The two likely scenarios are an attempt to strengthen the garrison position prior to an expected attack, or reinforcing the frontier prior to suspending the construction while troops are redeployed to deal with trouble elsewhere. Another important point about building the wall is that the large Roman garrison, normally strategically positioned to handle any threat of rebellion, was not at its normal home. In many ways the native population are almost invisible, making the odd guest appearance under the hooves of a victorious cavalry officer. However, they are the principal source of grain and a pool of manpower. These two are clearly related, as the manpower would normally be principally involved in producing the grain and other resources used by the Roman army. The construction of the wall disrupts the normal pattern of security, logistics, labour supply and, through that, the grain supply. Throw in the random factor of climate and any construction project that involved the natives may have had a significant negative economic and social impact. At this stage of the Roman occupation, one cannot presume that the population of the province were enthusiastic to participate in sealing themselves off from the rest of the island. Another line of evidence indicating that something went wrong with Hadrian's plan for the war is the career of Nepos. He was a friend of Hadrian and had been co-consul with him for a while in his reign. However, the governorship of Britain marked the end of Nepos' public career and according to our historical sources, the end of his friendship with the emperor, who held a grudge against him for the rest of his life. Nepos seems to have retired to Aquia, a long way from Rome. Turning to the issue of coinage, Hadrian introduced the figure of Britannia to the back of our coins. This female personification of the province is seated on a rock with a shield and spear and is wearing a cloak. What's interesting about Hadrian's Britannia is that she has her head in her hands, a gesture of mourning or sorrow. These female figures are an important feature of Roman coins, and this gesture of sorrow or mourning was last seen on the coins from Dacia following their defeat in the Second Dacian War. This unhappy Britannia persisted throughout Hadrian's reign and only took the form we would recognise today with his successor Antonius Pius. Coins have traditionally been important sources of information for historians, as they were used to convey political messages, although their dating is not straightforward. An exception are Roman coins issued in Alexandria, which are closely dated. Of interest are three issues from the first half of Hadrian's reign, marking victory in 119, 124 and 125. The first may be explained by the successful resolution of various conflicts in the beginning of Hadrian's reign. The two coins dated to 124 and 125 are traditionally more, or more of a mystery. It is shortly after his visit and Hadrian is still on his imperial tour. Supposedly work on his wall was in full swing and he had also initiated a building program in London. However, as we have seen, something went wrong with the wall at this early stage. There are a couple of hordes from the area of the wall, at Bird Oswald, and in particular at Thorngrafton, where a large hoard of coins was hidden and never recovered, in a quarry being used for the construction of the wall by the army. Hordes are associated with times of immediate danger, and the fact that they are not recovered may indicate that the Roman 
who felt the need to stash his cash, had met an adverse fate. Another interesting coin commemorates an expedition to Britain. It was issued after 128, so either it is commemorating Hadrian's visit or some later military expedition. The latter explanation is also supported by two different career inscriptions of soldiers who served on some form of expedition to the island. It is unlikely that these relate to Hadrian's visit, and it is not even clear that they both refer to a single event. All this is tantalising, if tenuous evidence of problems in Britain. However, they seem entirely consistent with the problems being experienced during the construction of the war. Tying archaeological events to a historical narrative becomes problematic when we have a very patchy and incomplete record. There is a perfectly natural tendency for the evidence to gravitate towards known historical events. Thus it was some time before archaeologists recognised that London had not only been burnt down in the Boudican Rebellion, but there was a second fire that could be distinguished, and that this was dated to the Hadrianic period. Recent developments such as Crossrail have provided fresh insights into the archaeology beneath the city. According to archaeologist Dominic Perring, the fire of London was quite extensive and may have affected the waterfront. His hypothesis is that following the fire a new jetty was built downstream, connected by road to a new fort built to the northeast of the city at Cripplegate. The most interesting aspect of the archaeology of this period is the skulls. Many excavations, particularly around the valley of the Walbrook, a small tributary of the Thames now buried under the city, turn up unusual numbers of loose skulls. This distinctive but limited sample of archaeology scales up to several thousand heads left lying around in the river valley immediately north of London. Following Dominic Perry's theory, the fire and the skulls are related to the subsequent militarisation of London, which may in turn relate to one of the military expeditions mentioned in the career inscriptions. Another important clue comes from the bronze head of Hadrian found in the Thames. This can reasonably be assumed to have been set up to commemorate the imperial visit, probably in the new forum. This head has been seriously battered, deliberately damaged and thrown in the river. Importantly, the Romano Cockneys preferred to destroy it rather than melting it down. To summarise, the initial plan laid out as a timber rampart with a ditch was to be replaced with a broad wall, but having completed perhaps two years' work, the project was suspended, as it may already be short of labour due to a lack of cooperation among one or more native groups. This may have developed into a more general revolt, if London had been the embarkation point for labour and other resources, it may have been targeted specifically. Always assuming this was the primary cause, any rebellion by the natives may of course have been opportunistic, with their legionary garrisons being away building a wall up north. As far as I understand it, the skulls in the Walbrook are the remains of young men who have been decapitated, offering two possibilities, either the natives or the Romans. Take your pick. The use of beheading and even the watery context makes me favour the idea that these are soldiers. The Romans generally preferred crucifixion and tended to be neater with their bodies following a mass execution, especially one so close to home. The scale of the disruption to the early plan for the war is consummate with a significant military confrontation between the army and the population. One of the most important studies of the war is by the master mason Peter Hill, whose insight into the stonework was very important. The big takeaway from his study is the lack of quality following the initial broad wall phase. When work resumes on the narrow wall, the standard is greatly reduced at a fundamental level, far more than can be accounted for by simple haste. This indicates that the evident drop in manpower was also notable for the loss of skilled men. Putting this together as a timeline, we can describe all this action to the governorship of the unfortunate Nepos, with two years of building, two years of fighting, with a year of mopping up confusion or as a margin of error. This takes us up to 127, when we know we have a new governor, Germanus. It must be assumed that he was responsible for the narrow war, which in turn makes little progress, and which to judge by subsequent changes was attacked from the north. The addition of extra forts in the central sector and perhaps the extension of the wall to the east, are a somewhat anachronistic smoking gun for attacks in this area. 
or to further mix my metaphors, represent a bolting of the architectural stable door. This also allows for a second military expedition bringing reinforcements to the island. It also may be associated with the arrival of the Governor Severus, who we know was later called away to fight elsewhere in 133, to be replaced by the fifth Hadrianic Governor and the fourth project manager for Hadrian's War. Much of the evidence for trouble in Britain during Hadrian's reign has long been known, and traditionally it was thought that this was mostly under the governorship of Falco, who had pacified the province early in Hadrian's tenure. The chaos surrounding the wall's construction has been reflected in the scholarship, which until David Breeze's ideas about dislocation has been so loose that it has been possible to characterise the wall as symbolic or a device to regulate trade and as something to keep the troops busy. There was little room in the classical mindset for a major military disaster. The final piece of damning evidence is that Hadrian's successor, Antonius Pius, considered it prudent to abandon the project and reoccupy the territory north of the wall. He then built a new wall, 39 miles long, across Scotland. From this we might also infer that the wall had been attacked from the north and that the Romans' allies had failed to act as an effective buffer. One final point of interest is the departure of Severus, who was called away to deal with the Bar Kokhba rebellion in 133 because he was Hadrian's top general, which is very much in keeping with the situation just described in Britain. In an eerie parallel to what had happened in Britain a decade earlier, Hadrian visited Jerusalem and decided to redevelop the city destroyed in the First Jewish War. The Roman historians noted the resulting conflagration, and the punitive devastation wrought by the army is quantified, with however half a million killed. We do not know the precise figures for the Roman casualties, but it can be inferred that they were significant. The reason for this digression into what Severus did on his holiday is that it helps us contextualise one of the best-known references to Britain during the time of Hadrian. It comes from a letter to the Emperor Marcus Aurelius from his tutor Frontius, comparing the troubles in Britain to those in Israel, which, as we have just noted, were significant. This is entirely in keeping with the massive scaling back of Hadrian's plans for a war, the loss of manpower and skill shortages. So on balance, I am happy to argue that this was a military disaster, due to its flawed design and ultimately the strain it would put on the resources of the native population. By examining just three aspects of the archaeological evidence, we have achieved a new understanding of what Hadrian had planned and ultimately what went wrong and thwarted his efforts. Of our initial eight points that form the basis of our existing commercial narrative, all but one on detailed examination have proved inaccurate, inadequate or misleading characterizations of the archaeological evidence. It is also clear that many of our ideas expressed in our visual culture, while unsupported by the evidence, are nevertheless often central to our understanding of the war. More broadly, Given the brutal realities of warfare and poverty in most periods, those of the Roman world were easily overlooked in favour of their role as the civilization. Successful, stable, something of a golden age, perhaps even a role model for aspiring imperialists. Their walk on part in the Bible has ensured a role in our childhood and our first steps into the past. And it is not just popular culture that is conditioned by words and pictures. It is clear that aspects of the literary tradition, while lacking any real evidential base, are so strong that contrary evidence is simply ignored. This has created self-referential myths and a faith-based narrative. The long-standing myth, for that's what it is, that part of the wall was built from turf, has far-reaching implications. Firstly, archaeologists projecting these ideas onto the evidence are forced to conclude that any fort not made of stone must be made of turf. As a result, many Roman forts have a primary turf phase. Secondly, ideas about walls being made from turf, developed by medieval and Elizabethan historians, were so influential as to affect the translation of Latin texts. Knowing there was an earlier turf wall, the passage in Antoninus Pius's biography 
describing the building of the Antonine Wall, was translated as he built another or a second turf wall. All subsequent archaeological investigation has proceeded on this basis, although, again, I am not aware of any scientific evidence that this UNESCO World Heritage Site was ever constructed from turf. As noted in the introduction, a lack of deductive and analytical methodology ensures that the interpretation is guided by the existing narrative, thus confirmation and observer bias is an integral part of the methodology employed by many excavators. It was also suggested that being taught archaeology out of a book by an academic who learnt it out of a book inevitably leads to excavators who will be guided by the book and seek only to find what confirms the existing narrative. Part of the problem is that qualification for teaching archaeology is based on the ability to reproduce these existing narratives to the satisfaction of their proponents. An archaeologist with the skill set to understand archaeological evidence and to deconstruct textual narratives won't survive in a system where the preservation of such medieval and Victorian concepts as the turf wall and vallum attest to the studiousness with which texts are replicated. While archaeologists find bucket loads of soil, this is a field where a background in Latin is considered more important than knowledge of soil science, despite the former seldom being found in a hole in the ground. There is another problem. It's a bit like inventing a great new fizzy drink. Don't bother taking it to Coca-Cola, because they already have one, so we'll just kill it. Archaeology is just another money spinner for universities. The fact that you can demolish a narrative sold to students in an hour or so is not going to make you any friends. Besides, having a narrative that is full of non-sequiturs and circularity is good for business. It ensures it will remain a mystery, regardless of how much beer and public money is pumped into it. While many aspects of the academic appreciation of Hadrian's Wall are shockingly poor, they are on a whole different level to what's going on in British prehistory. Hadrian's Wall is saved by being something of an international effort, and this attracts more funding than other aspects of archaeology. However, the principal redeeming feature is that Romans are also found abroad, which probably saved the narrative from going completely rogue, although by and large they don't find turf walls, vallums, kippy pits and giant lilia anywhere else. The initial objective was to understand Hadrian's Wall by solving a mystery represented by a series of archaeological phases of uncertain purpose, which when approached from the perspective of classical scholarship had produced a narrative divorced from many aspects of the archaeological evidence. The use of modelling and maths to understand engineered structures, combined with the more traditional approaches of soil science, paleobotany and palynology, provides a much more neutral approach to the types of evidence actually recovered by archaeology. So we have not only solved the mystery of Hadrian's Wall, we have also gained an insight into why one of the largest archaeological structures in the world is still a mystery. While the existing academic methodology would not disgrace a medieval scriptorium or a madrasa, such slavish reproduction of the narrative has, thankfully, been abandoned in most other disciplines. Luckily, this is archaeology, not social work or medicine, so nobody is going to die, which is rather the point. It does not matter. You don't find Baldrick, celebrities or local volunteers doing forensic accounting or midwifery at the weekends but they are free to hack holes in unique archaeological monuments for public entertainment. As a practitioner looking from the outside, it is apparent that few subjects have been dumbed down quite as much as archaeology. The ability to copy out other people's ideas in your best handwriting, while a worthy skill, is not actually the mindset of the archaeologist, who needs to be able to think for themselves. It's now over a decade since my work on the Timber Frontier first became known. It featured on the BBC, local media and even the History Channel. Initially, the professor at Newcastle, quite bright by local standards, was supportive, alive to the implications of a timber phase of the frontier. Sadly, for myself, and in some respects for the study of this internationally important archaeological monument, any support had to be withdrawn when it became apparent that one of my tutors, with the backing of the postgraduate dean, neither of whom had, had done me the courtesy of reading any of my work, branded it worthless. So, on a deeper level, 
This is also about how universities primarily exist to look after the interests of academics. There is no wider sense of responsibility. Adrian's Wall may be an internationally funded archaeological monument, but petty parochial politics of the local Russell Brand University will always have priority. Caveat emptor. So in conclusion, and to return to Hadrian's Wall, it is possible to argue on the basis of the archaeology and the history that this was a hidden disaster, obscured by Roman historians and our own Romano-centred view of the world. What is interesting to the archaeologist is the way in which this deduction is entirely in keeping with historians' judgment of Hadrian himself. The critical analysis of the unfortunate Polydorus comes to mind. For whoever designed the wall was overconfident and lacked an eye for detail. There is a similar lack of empathy or awareness of the native population when it came to considering the consequences of his decision. I think it is this arrogance, while entirely appropriate or at least understandable an emperor that led to a military disaster in Britain centred round his unsuccessful attempts to build a wall. Thank you very much for watching Understanding Hadrian's Wall.